Ernie, we're not going to be talking about levitating this evening. We're no. going to talk all about incense and spirituality. And I know you've got a great backstory on the spiritual sky. You know, yeah, it helped. You know, this, this week I've got my feet firmly on the ground. Even though my head's in the clouds, I got my feet on the ground. So, yeah, we're going to be talking about um, a lot of cool stuff that we did. It's kind of funny how at Pacific Ioneer we had a, a large variety of things that we did. We were very disruptive. Today they would call it disruption. You know, then it was just being, it was being as crazy as you could be in the record business and then try and carry that over into the corporate world because there was more money in the corporate world than there was in the record stuff. But we used one to leverage the other and into the other. And we were very lucky. We were extremely lucky. And by 1975, Pacific Ioneer was pretty well established as a very cutting edge album cover design company. But we were also, like we've talked in the past, Joyce, that always had one foot into corporate America because they never wanted us to get pigeonholed. They never wanted us to become the guys that do the album covers. Yeah, the album covers were cool, and that got us recognition, okay? To this day, it's got me recognition. But back then, it was, it was a, only one small piece of how we had to exist because there wasn't really huge budgets in doing album covers. I mean, I think that Alice Cooper paid us more than anybody else. And I think the most expensive album we did for Alice was like $5,000. And that was all in illustrations, paintings, mechanicals, you know, you name it, all of it. So we had to really sort of to exist when the record business, like any other business goes through dips and highs and stuff like that. And it did as the music changed, you know, the players changed and the, the whole world changed that world. So the corporate world was a little more st stable. And, and that was a nice balance to the music world that was kind of crazy up and down. So it was kind of a nice balance. And, you know, by 1975, we were, like I said, we were pretty established. And at one, and I remember one time we were coming back from meeting with the Jefferson Airplane in San Francisco. And Tony, my partner, and I were flying back, and uh, we landed at LAX, and we came out of the terminal, and there's these Hare Krishna guys, and they're all like with the shaved Baba Ganesh haircut, and the, the robes and the bead bags, and they're bouncing, they got bongos and stuff, and they're giving out incense and, and flowers and stuff. And so it was like a carryover from the 60s, you know, the love and, you know, that whole generation into, yeah, peace, love and good drugs and, and you know, uh, religion. Religion became a big part of it. Because you can remember, you know, at the same time, religion was kind of creeping in through people like George Harrison. Okay. And the, Be the Beatles first in George Harrison with, you know, Bangladesh, you know, and then there was, you know, uh, other forms of music. You know, there were a few others, but George Harrison in Bangladesh was one that really sort of, you know, brought Rabbi Shinkar and Indian music. It was all kind of, and the Hare Krishnas was kind of like an offset, you know, offshoot of the heavy Indian religion. And so it was all kind of crazy. And then in more stable gospel music, you have groups like Swan Silvertongue, who were, were bringing gospel music into mainstream into rock and roll into you know because of the religious aspects of where these musicians were going groups like that were able to get some rec recognition and you and i had talked about swan silvertone in the past one of my favorite band one of my favorite groups uh, i would highly recommend it to our neighbors on the block if you get a chance and you want to get inspired and get your toe tapping and your soul popping, check out Swan Silvertone. You know, they'll, they'll change your life. Uh, and their music is amazing. And so, you know, we bumped into this guy, Carl, who we knew from New York. His name was Carl Lang, and he was a musician. He was an engineer and kind of like a junior producer learning the business in New York. And, and we spent some time in recording studios uh, especially when I went, went to work for Craig and working with Tony and those guys, and we'd go with the bands, you know, in the, in the recording studio and listening and meeting and stuff like that. And, and so we kind of knew Carl, and he came to the office a couple times to hang out. And then we kind of, Tony, my partner, stayed in touch with him, and I sort of lost track of him, and then we bumped into him at the airport. 
and we started talking and you know he was telling us about how he had come out here he wanted to be a producer and he got kind of into this whole you know Hare Krishna kind of thing and it really brought him peace of mind and it felt really good to him and so he decided to go into that but he also was still at heart a producer and loved music so he convinced the higher ups in the Hare Krishna organization uh, to build him a state-of-the-art recording studio. Because of the groups and, and the music that we've been talking about earlier, um, there was a, a pitch that he laid on them about, look, you want to get new devotees, it's much easier to get younger people than it is to get older people, and what's the one link between, you know, religion and music, you know, and cons young consumers is music. Let's produce, get some great musicians, which they did, and let's produce an album, okay? And we'll give that album away. They give it away free, because remember, it's religion, they don't pay taxes, and that's a great write-off. So they built them this studio, and in the meantime, he had introduced us. They have these feasts on every Saturday where you can go and they have all the, they don't eat any meat, it's all dairy stuff, and it's really actually pretty interesting food. And so we went to a couple of those. We met a few of the guys, and, you know, they were, I mentioned to you, they were really funny because the business guys were just like the guys that were bouncing outside the airport with the robes and the haircut and the bead bags, but they carried briefcases, and they drove around in a new Rolls Royce. So these guys were the business guys, just like he was a, a, music, a musician, engineer, producer, they were business guys that then got into the religion and they're running the business part of the, the religion. And he's convinced them that they should build him this recording studio so he could create this album. So anyway, they started using us uh, on their incense. They have all that instance is like amazing because they make, they make it for free. It's just the cost of goods, which is really cheap. And all the devotees, that's what they do when they're not doing other stuff. They're making incense. We would go over there to a facility and they had a couple hundred people just sitting there all day long making sticks of incense and they package them and sell them, sell them and, you know, give it away at airports, get people in, into it. And so they were already realizing that there was a connection between music and young consumers and drawing people into their religion. So they challenged us to how can we, you know, how can we further connect? We're doing this album. We're still working on it, but we need to start doing it now. We need to start doing it in, we want to start doing some advertising. We want to do some in-store work with display racks. You know, they have the racks with the incense in them, and we did a header card that went on top. And you'll see a lot of that stuff behind me here. This color thing in the middle here is the header card that went on top of the incense rack. And so what we did was there was a, a very famous cartoonist. His name was Windsor McKay, and he created the first animated film, Gertie the Dinosaur. Okay, and it's just this dinosaur swinging backwards, a line drawing. And, but that was the first one. And then he went on to create Little Nemo in Slumberland. And I don't know whether you know who, if you've ever seen it, but it used to be a comic strip. When I was a kid, it would be on the, in the comic section of the paper, uh, only on Sundays. And he was an amazing cartoonist and illustrator. And if you haven't, look him up. You can see some of the stuff that he did in early animation that was just incredible. But he did this cartoon series called Little Nemo in Slumberland. And Little Nemo was this kid that would eat rarebit cheese before he went to bed. And he'd have these insane, insane hallucinogenic dreams. Okay, and he would go to these all, through all these adventures, the adventures of Little Nemo in Slumberland. And he had one character that that looked like a uh, a, uh, a you know a, a native in the jungle, but he didn't speak any language. It was all this crazy gibberish. And and it turned out that Windsor McKay was an opium addict because opium was legal back then, and he became an opium addict. And he'd write and draw Little Nemo in Slumberland. So we took that Little Nemo in Slumberland concept and we created Snaz. And Snaz was a nose with ears and feet, okay? And the whole idea was that when you listen to music, if you burn incense at the same time, it heightens the musical experience. And it's true. I mean, 
you know, how many times did we sit back and listen to music and just burn? I do it all the time out in my office. I, I constantly burn incense and I listen to rock and roll really loud. And I'll sometimes listen to gospel and I'll sometimes listen to country. And, and the incense always does enhance the experience. So we needed to bridge that gap, to create that link. And Snaz did it. He was a little messenger, and you can see him up here. He's a little messenger, and I'll send you this so you can blow it up and do stuff. But he is a messenger that came down to earth to turn people on to burning incense when they're listening to music. So we created these cartoon strips in the style of Windsor McKay, where it's it's even though it's a still drawing, you, it, it, each frame grows and gets bigger, just like a little Nemo cartoon. It gets crazier and crazier as this thing goes on. And I blew up a section up here where you can see the calligraphy and little snaz running with the wings on his feet. And these illustrations were done by Bill Garland, okay, who was a staff illustrator at Pacific Pioneer. We worked together for a long time, and he learned a lot from Drew, and Drew learned a lot from him, and I learned a lot from both of them, and they both learned from me. So it was a great experience. And what we did was did this, what you see there, is a half-page ad that ran in Rolling Stone magazine, okay? We did two half pages and a full page. And I'll send you those images so that if you want to, you know, blow this up so people could see it. The interesting thing about this art is that like Bill, like Drew, he, Bill had a talent that was amazing for cartooning. And Drew taught him how to draw more realistic figures. And Bill taught Drew how to do cartoons. And we're at one of the shows coming up. We're going to be talking about a whole series of cartoons that Drew did for Flying Tiger Air Freight. And he was not a cartoonist. And then he did Watergate Comedy Hour. And then he never did that stuff again. He went into movie posters. So it's, it's this crazy thing that all came together, uh, you know, combining this religious thing with music. And the ads we ran in uh, Rolling Stone did really, really well. I mean, we had a great relationship going with those guys for about three or four years. And then people move on and people change. And, you know, I don't really remember exactly why we ended up working with them, but it wasn't bad. It was just, you know, you move on. Other things happen and, you know, you just get, you know, you get sidetracked. But it was really a fun account, you know, and, and, and what I wanted to say was you can see from this frame here in the middle, right here, the calligraphy. Bill Garland not only had a talent to draw cartoons and then became a great realistic painter as well. And in fact, in the movie business, the movie posters that Drew didn't get, Bill got. And what people don't know is all three of us came up together. Those guys, Bill Garland came out of the Air Force and was like a photographer and liked to do car cartooning and he did calligraphy. The calligraphy on these ads are amazing. He never made a mistake. Each O is exactly the same O, each R. And it's a, in a very unique style. And again, I'll, I'll send you some things so you can see. And these cartoon strips were done on acetate, frosted acetate. So he would draw the images and then do the calligraphy right on the, we have, it's like a cell, like a black animation cell, black and white. And the, I mean, it's just, they're beautiful. There's three of them. And like I said, and they're big. The full page is probably, you know, huge like this, half page is half that. But they're beautiful, big pieces. And, you know, it, it was a, an amazing experience that we had with working with these guys. And then, you know, that evolved into other stuff. And like I said, other clients, and, you know, it, they went a, a different way or whatever. But, you know, it's still funny if you, if you Google, you know, uh, Hare Krishna or the uh, spiritual sky snaz, all that stuff comes up. It's still up there, you know, which is really kind of crazy. And, you know, the album was called Change Your Heart. And that album cover was done by Drew Struzan. And you can't see it real well here, but when I send you the images, you can blow it up. It's, a, it's called Change of Heart. And it was kind of subliminally for young people that maybe had made a decision or moving away from the religion they were grown up with, because that was a big trend. When you get to be, you know, 20, 18, 20, you move away from your established religion and you become your own God and you go through all those changes. And then as you get older, you end up coming back 
you know, un in into the fold. And that's the beautiful thing about religion. You're always welcome back, you know. And, um, and so, you know, change of heart was to hit that younger audience. And what it is, it's a beautiful Arthur Rackham was a children's book illustrator in the, I guess, the 1800s. And he did a lot. He was English, and he did a lot of children's books. And, in fact, Ingrid Hinkey was, in, was really influenced by him when she did the Toys in the Attic cover for Aerosmith. That's an Arthur Rackham kind of style. Change of Heart that Bill did an even better Arthur Rackham uh, ripoff. It's a caterpillar who's got these glasses and he's old and he's up. You're like looking at him and then you're, you can see down to where the vine that he's on. It's like Jack and the Beanstalk. You can see the land and all that stuff. And he's like a thousand feet in the air and he's getting old and he's metamorphosing into a butterfly, which happens on the back cover. I mean, it's just those two pieces are absolutely beautiful. Carl Ramsey did the back cover. Bill did the front cover. And they're a beautiful set because it really is a change of life. We all do it. You know, Aerosmith, we were talking about that cover the other day. And, and I said, you know, it was really Toys in the Attic was really uh, eventually the evolution of Teddy Bear's funeral, which was when you are a kid, you have kids' toys. When you become an adult, you put away the kids' toys. And you become, it's a rite of passage. It's an evolution. It's a metamorphosis. So basing all that on this stuff that we did for Spiritual Sky, it worked really, really well. You can still get the album. I mean, they're still selling it. This was probably 25 years ago, maybe more. You know, it was, well, it was 1975. You know, so it was, uh, it was really a, an interesting assignment, one that combined both corporate and music and art. You know, it kind of was right in our sweet spot. We had never done anything like that. But I'll tell you, the, the team at Pacific Ioneer, we could stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with anybody. It was an amazing – it was like having a winning sports team, you know, and, and everything that they did was a total team effort. We worked together. We learned together. We, you know, we grew together, and it was, it was amazing. It was an amazing period for me from 1972 – to about 1976 and that four years five years 77 you know it was like our champion year our, our champion season every every season was a winner you know and it was just amazing i mean it was a great time and and, and as far as music Already, this is all. I, okay, I well, let me right. see if we are on the same radar well, on maybe, this one. Maybe we will. Well, first of all, from the Change of Heart album, uh, A Change of Heart is a good song, and that's Carl's song. Carl Lang, who was the producer, he was also a musician. And then um, I'd like to, I'd like you to consider George Harrison's uh, "My Sweet Lord." That was one of them, Ernie. Okay, that good. good. And then my last one is, you know. Mary, Don't You Weep by Swan Silverton. Oh, and that yeah. probably didn't enter into your top three. No, grade. it did not. It but did I, not. Think that, I think that your, your fans and your people here on the block, our neighbors, would really love it. I mean, there's nothing wrong with getting a little soul cleansing and getting that upbeat. That's the beautiful thing about Swan Silverton. They're, they're preaching to you, but they're preaching to you in a way that you're just really – open for it. And that's what change of heart was. That was, he did that in a way that was easy to listen to and it felt comfortable. And it was like eating something that you couldn't stop eating because it was so good. That's what that music was. You know, it really was the, the way Carl produced that was pretty incredible. And uh, I have, I still have an album, but I don't have a record player. So <laughs> I've got all these albums with no record player. Uh, I can loan you mine. Yeah, there you go. There you go. I need to convert it. I mean, it's actually a pretty good album. It's got a lot of really big musicians on it. Not big, but good musicians. And uh, it, he did a great job producing it, you know. And uh, like I said, they're still selling it. So it must be something like it was 1975. That's, that's a long time ago.
We yeah. really learned a lot this evening on this particular project and backstory. Yeah. And, you know, when I think about the incense, you know, even in, like, you know, growing up, uh, going to Catholic school and in the Catholic yeah. church, when they started incorporating the folk masses, you know, the incense was in church and sure. you could smell it. And it really, uh, I guess it raised your vibration in a way, you know, to really put you into a very calm and receptive spirit. Yeah. My favorite part, of uh, the Catholic Church and that whole experience, because I went to Catholic school and all that, was benediction, because they had the the chalice that where they were on the on the chain and it had the ends the frankincense or whatever it was burning in there and would fill the whole church. We, my, I went to St. Joseph's in San Jose and they they that was a high that was a school elementary and uh, kindergarten and elementary that was connected to the church and and. Uh, um, St. Joseph's Church is still the main church in San Jose. It's a beautiful church. And, and uh, yeah, you, you're right. With the with Music came into religion with, like you said, this folk, the folk churches and, and priests playing guitars during the services yes. and stuff. And, you know, it's funny because the black churches always had that. Mm -hmm. They always had it, man. I remember when I was a kid, I was probably, I don't know, maybe 11 or 12. And every Sunday, a couple of friends and I would sneak over to, there was a, an area of San Jose that was, uh, had this big Catholic church, uh, black church. And we would listen outside. You know, there was an alleyway between the church and this house. And we would be on the other side of the fence and just listen because they'd have the windows open. And it was amazing. It was just amazing, their music and the singing and all that stuff. And they had it. They had it down. And then later on, you know, other religions picked up on it. You know what I mean? But the music and religion and the emotional feel that it makes you have, like you said, it's a no-brainer to put incense right in there with it because it just heightens the experience, you know. So anyway... It sure wow. does. And I've got another song that just started coming into my okay. mind. It is uh, what we call on the block party a naked radio favorite. It means we're exposing you to something you probably okay. haven't heard. Should South I take West. my clothes off? Uh, <laughs> hey, that's great. Hey, naked, naked. Okay. Naked but, radio. Oh, well, there you go. You know, I grew up in the 60s. Everybody's got naked. It's funny South because the president of our class and when I was in college, his name was Malcolm Fitzer, and we were really good friends. And every time he would come to the house, the first thing he'd do is take all his clothes off. We didn't do it. Bonnie and I were like, whoa, we were really concerned. But he'd walk around naked, had nothing, you know, but that was the era. That was, that was the, uh, that what is... he did, you know, and he was the president of the class. So, you know, that was kind of cool. And we did the, we did the school newspaper. We put it out for a, a couple of years called The Egg. It was, I've, I've got them all. It was just, the, it oh, was that... the, Another experience that maybe we'll talk about at some point. That is so funny. The song is Southwest. Well, it's called uh, Southwest FOB is the group. And the song is Smell of Incense. Really? Oh, yes. well, yeah. There I you go. That's a, a, that just started coming into my mind. Yeah, and well, if I'm I not mistaken, John Ford Coley was in the group. It was, oh, uh, okay. I, I think it was England, Dan, and John Ford Coley in right. the early days. I really liked those guys. They were great. Yes, yeah. they, they were, were like Seals and Croft. And, you know, mm -hmm. There were a lot of duo guys like that. Uh, what's their names from the 50s? Peter and Gordon. Peter, was it Peter and Gordon from the 60s? Peter and Gordon. Yeah, they yeah. Was, Night in Rusty <laughs> Armor and Woman, and they, they were great. They yeah, were great. Yeah. So, anyway, all right. Well, Joyce, as always, and our neighbors on the block, thank you so much for letting me spin a yarn with you. And I'm looking forward to next week. And, you know, thank you so much. I really appreciate it, Joyce. You're, real, you're really uh, great. I, I love you. You're awesome. Love you too. I love all our neighbors too. You are the best. You are okay. the best. You take care. <laughs> I feel like Richard Nixon. <laughs> <laughs>